Uh, we're really glad that Taka made the trip from uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, where he's been for the last seven years. Uh, but he's leaving. He is starting an MFA program at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee in the fall. Uh, so he will be braving the Western winters. Um, grab a postcard, if you want, of Taka's uh, uh, one screenshot from uh, his video there up at the front uh, table. Um, we were introduced to Taka's work by uh, Vanessa Rennick. For those of you from Portland who know Vanessa as a filmmaker, she brought this to us, and the exhibition committee loved it, and now we're showing it. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Taka. Welcome. Oh, great. Thanks. A lot of my work, I deal with this sort of idea of disillusionment and the capacity for the human psychology to construct these great facades. And for me, I really sort of try to romanticize that tragedy and, you know, that either realizing that these things that were thought as majestic that were once great, you know, aren't really so. And so with uh, my piece, 9214, uh, I was really looking at the train and the freight train and uh, the idea for this started when I was actually location scouting for a sort of narrative piece that I never actually made and I was really looking at, you know, the, the narrative film took place mostly around a railroad track so I was, you know, hanging out by the tracks a lot and I would, I'd be standing there watching these trains pass and everyone that was, you know, stuck at the railroad crossing, I'd be looking at their faces and they'd just be looking really bored. A lot of cars would actually come to the railroad crossing when they saw the bars go down, they'd actually turn around and try to find another way around. And, you know, just thinking about the history of the train and sort of, you know, with the Industrial Revolution and how it brought around, it was thought of as this great thing, innovation and how it's going to turn, you know, and it did change industry all over the world and connected, you know, broad spaces together in terms of, you know, people and, uh, and material and, and so I was thinking about that and contrasting that with the faces and that I saw at the crossing and you know, thinking about also with uh, film history and, you know, one of the first filmmakers, uh, Lumiere Brothers, um, and one of their first screenings, um, you know, they had this piece, um, you know, which was this, where, you know, it was a train arriving at a station and, you know, at the screening, you know, when that train was arriving, people assumed that they, you know, they didn't know what, you know, film, a projected film was, and they, some people ran out of the screening space because they were afraid that the train was actually going to run over them. So, just thinking about, you know, that and, and film history, and you know, and I was also looking at um, this. Uh, PSA from the 1950s of the Rock Island train line and pretty much all of that was about the idea that the train and American industry were, you know, they were interconnected, interwoven and that the train was an, inter an integral part to, you know, the American dream, the idea about, you know, achieving success and so bringing that around to uh, my piece, I was, I was kind of looking for any way to bring back that sort of luster of the freight train. And the way that came about was, you know, just watching the train pass, I kept uh, seeing how much space was between the bottom of the train and the bottom of the track. So it occurred to me through that, that there was enough space for me to put a camera down. So I, I thought that, you know, with the camera getting run over by the train, that would sort of bring about this new perspective, this new way of trying to relive the glory of the train. And then um, I thought from here I'd uh, talk about some other work that I've done. And I'll start with, um, so in addition to film work, I also uh, do uh, still photography work. So 
Um, and a lot of the still photography work also deals with this idea of disillusionment. And the series of work that I'll, sh uh, I'll show a couple samples of is, you know, about this sort of, you know, this classic I idea of, you know, youth and sort of teenage angst and sort of the idea of growing up and we we as humans sort of tend to idolize parent figures in adolescence and you know there are these sort of these figures where we rely on them for our well-being and nurturing and everything like that and you know as you grow older into teenage years a lot of times you know there's the whole idea of rebellion rebelling against a parent and also realizing that you know these people that were once supposed to be thought of and were your greatest idols might not necessarily be so but so with that in mind I was you know the way to do that for me was to use this you know this trope of the interior versus the exterior so I shot these landscapes, and with this whole series, I never shot a single portrait. It was all through landscapes and interiors. So I put, I juxtaposed these landscapes, you know, and I, I used a particular palette, which was sort of um, this muted palette to sort of, to sort of, you know emphasize the fact that, you know, although like that last um, image, even though it's, a, you know, this field and golden hour sunlight, I tried to mute that color down so it doesn't become, so there's something actually beneath the surface that's a little weary, that's discomforting. And I balanced those exterior shots with interior shots like these where it's just you know empty chairs you know empty room in the background this these sort of desolate backgrounds and like a photo of this that's actually um, my, my actual bed that my dad sleeps on um, so my parents have this sort of like strange relationship where they don't sleep in the same room so even though they're married they don't sleep in the same room and you know this is my dad's actual bedroom where you know it's very void and there's nothing in there and it's you know and i think a lot of that also has to do with you know his line of work where he works in medical research so it's all about keeping things clean sterile and organized so it's this it, so you know as as a child you know i i had this really close relationship with my dad where he would always, you know, you know, play catch, do all that stuff that you would do as a kid and then sort of realizing, you know, later that through like all these arguments and things like that, that, you know, it, the relationship wasn't, at, the, the sort of divide in the relationship and growing distance. So in that way, you know, I, I felt like this image was sort of the, the, defining symbol of that and that you know there's that invitation in there where and where my what I once thought you know of my father is now absent so in that bed. Uh, most recently a lot of my film and video work uh, deals with ideas coming out of literature so uh, this next piece uh, which is, I'll show a clip of. Um, it comes from sort of reading, you know, through Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar and sort of this idea of, you know, pushing the balance of the human psychology to its breaking point. The capacity of when does life become too unbearable? And I'll show the clip and I'll talk a little more after that.
So um, that was just about a minute and a half clip of a 17 minute piece, but really, so a lot of, with that piece, what I was doing was, you know, having these very quiet images and balancing that with these subtle sounds like that you would hear, like, you know, with like hearing tests, you'd, you'd have those different frequencies. And then, you know, with the, the lamp, it was the, the metronome and the beating. So it was really about juxtaposing these quiet images with these sort of sounds that over time, over the, the course of the film become absolutely unbearable. So with, and it's split into three sections where the first part is a single image, a long take where a droning sound slowly escalates to sort of a, a deafening level where, and then the middle part is that lamp and then the last part is um, actually seeing the metronome. So with that, you know, it was, it was sort of thinking about, you know, the narrative of the bell jar and the idea of, you know, this protagonist idea of life being unbearable. I, you know, I was trying to push these often and, you know, mundane things like the, a, the, a lamp, a light, and then, you know, gnats flying and, you know, people just sitting and, you know, so these ordinary things and visual images and, you know, stylizing them in a way where the image becomes very, you know, you're focused on, you know, what actually is behind that and, you know, and then realizing that, you know, these are these things we were surrounded by every day and then pushing, using the audio to heighten that, you know, to a point of, you know, the idea of, you know, this thing from ordinary everyday life slowly becomes unbearable. So the next body of work um, that I'll talk about is the series um, inspired by a biography of Amelia Earhart that I read. And, and, and this was some, something that I read um, a couple years ago when it was the 75th year of the anniversary of her disappearance. And, I, you know, just, I'd known about Amelia Earhart and like all her accomplishments and, but, you know, reading through her biography, I started realizing that I was much more interested in the other female aviators that were mentioned in the, in the book and sort of this idea of how, you know, these other aviators aren't as, you know, heralded or aren't as well known as Amelia Earhart and, you know, just in trying to research the other aviators, you know, I sort of, I came across that, you know, through internet search culture, you know, it sort of perpetuates this idea of, you know, heightening this hero figure and, you know, pushing down these other aviators that were, you know, just as qualified, if not more qualified pilots than Amelia Earhart. Like, um, this is uh, Amy Johnson and she had a bunch, you know, she was the first person to fly solo from England to Australia. She had a bunch of distance records and this, you know, this was the other, I mean, aviator that actually challenged Amelia Earhart for a lot of different things and it's Eleanor Smith and she was the only person to, you know, she did things like flying under all, and is today still the only person to fly under all the bridges in New York and, you know, and then, you know, flew and then, you know, had a bunch of altitude records and, you know, these other aviators, they set all these records and had all these accomplishments but we never hear about them and you know part of that is you know I think due to who Amelia Earhart was associated with with George Putnam and you know having that power of the press with her and then you know I'm trying to research that um, all these aviators you know all I whenever I typed in their aviators name what you know the thing that Google does is you know it kicks to the related searches which would say, you know, did you mean Amelia Earhart? Did you mean this person? And it would show related searches which would always include Amelia Earhart. So what I did was uh, I took that idea and the idea of 
internet culture and this sort of like web of confusion that it creates. And I created these white boxes where um, in the back you see what Google does with the did you mean, and then that in the back is a white box of Amelia Earhart, and in the center are I made um, some uh, other light boxes of the other female aviators that were flying around the time of Amelia Earhart that are never heard of. Uh, two simple lines leading one from Amelia Earhart into the center and one, you know, leading after the related searches and in the middle is again to sort of create that idea of the web of confusion. I, so I made a tangled mess of the center cords leading up from the the stack of all the other female you know, aviators. Uh, recently, I just also made another, uh, you know, uh, another video piece about Amelia Earhart because there was a quote in the novel, uh, or sorry, the biography about Amelia Earhart that really stuck with me, and it was this idea that Amelia Earhart and this other pilot had this sort of supernatural ability to predict or to locate airplane crashes. So, you know, I was thinking about that and just her disappearance and in the biography it detailed this one account where there was a plane crash and, you know, the police, everyone, you know, involved couldn't find it and then Amelia Earhart said it's at this location. They went to that location and sure enough it was there. So, I I came. I, I kept thinking about that, and you know, thinking about the, you know, the tragedy in Amelia Earhart's disappearance, and the fact that you know, if she did have this ability, you know, the sort of tragedy of her not being able to see her own, you know, downfall while being able to know where others were, or the, the idea that you know, she did know that before her, you know attempt to fly around the world that she was not going to make it. So, um, it's a short piece, it's about five minutes, so I'll show the whole thing. And So, and, you know, with the idea of, you know, psychic abilities traveling through waves, I and also her disappearance occurring at the ocean. The whole soundtrack is of waves.
So basically that whole piece, you know, is centered around that one quote from the biography where, you know, I really became interested in this, the supernatural and sort of the, the idea of, you know, the human mind's ability to either have these, you know, psychic abilities or, you know, cre and, and create these, or, you know, these ideas or create these, you know, facts from a different place that, you know, might actually be from or manifest themselves in the present world. And, you know, going out of that idea, um, I have two more piece clips that I'm going to show and, you know, going from that and this sort of interest in the supernatural and I became interested in sort of this classic idea of fate and, you know, and predetermination and I sort of balanced that with these quotes from um, Dante's Inferno and pulling quotes from that I sort of, I created this sort of quasi diary piece of, you know, you know, what happens when, you know, someone who believed in fate or, you know, someone, this hypothetical of someone who believes in fate and then realizing that their perception of what they thought fate was actually doesn't exist and sort of pulling quotes from the Divine Comedy and and using that as sort of this guide to move that person through their sort of emotional or psychological health space and it's just a short clip for that and uh, the piece is titled um, That Which Moves the Universe which is a quote from the last sentence from the Divine Comedy. So with that one, you know, with the idea of, you know, fate and the idea of that being such a personal, you know, thing that's only contained within this self, you know, I, I decided to make it because as sort of this diary piece and using VHS because of the idea of the home movie and then, you know, that last sequence, you know, shooting 
myself in the water just because it is all contained within the singular self. And then, uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, the last piece I'll just go very quickly and it's still, you know, dealing with literature and uh, with this I was, I'm thinking about the Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and the idea of, again, this lone figure with dealing with these sort of perils of the voyage and the not real, and then, you know, tying that with the voyage of another manner, uh, Ernest Shackleton and his voyage to the uh, Antarctic and how that went sour. So this is just a short clip from that. that Okay, thank you. Yeah.